ears, big lips. I don't care if you got bumps all over your face. I don't care if you are what the world considers ugly. And I tell you, there's no such thing because beauty is in the eye of the beholder. So when I behold myself in the mirror, and I know that I'm fearfully and wonderfully made, I step back and say, God, look at what you did. Woo, glory to God. I know you didn't make anybody else that looked like me. Because he didn't. He made you. And you are unique. And you don't have to compare yourself to anybody. That's how fine you are. You are so fine that you're the only one. Now, if you can't believe that, I don't know what to do to help you. So I'm supposed to stir up some stuff on the inside of you. I just stirred up fine in you. <laughs> Ought to change how you walk, how you stand, how you carry yourself, how you look at other folk. They looking down at you, you looking up at them going. Amen. 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 As a man thinketh, so if you think you're fine, you are fine. If you walk fine, you are fine. You think fine, you are fine. You talk fine, you are fine. You know what I'm talking about? I'm tired of people saying, oh, you know, I don't look like you. Oh, shut up! <laughs> God says you're fearfully and wonderfully made. I like what it says in Genesis. You better re realize this. Everything that the Lord God made was what? Good. Everything that the Lord God was made was what? Well, I'm good. Amen. What scripture was I on? I'm still in James. All right. Verse 3. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work is what? Patience, Patience is cheerful endurance. You're happy, excited as you're going through this thing. Verse 4. But let patience have her perfect work. In other words, you want it to complete the process that ye may be perfect or spiritually mature, and entire or complete. What's the next two words? Huh? Wanting nothing. What? Wanting nothing. Do you know a street in this city that has two names? Two words in the name? No, 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 in this city. In, in, we're in St. Louis, so give me a street anywhere that has, there's two names to the street. Halls Ferry, Westminster, never heard of that one, <laughs> West Florissant, okay, West Florissant, those are streets, would, would you agree? Well, see, I live on the street of wanting nothing. You can live wherever you want, but you see, I want to live on this street of what? Wanting nothing. And watch this, watch this, what? You can't want nothing until you get on the street. That's why most people are not there yet. Because they're waiting to move on the street. No, you got to move on the street before you get wanting nothing. So you can't say I don't want anything until you get on the street. Is that where you live? I'm wanting nothing. And you begin to say that. I don't want anything. Every need is met. Every bill is paid. See, so you're looking at me real crazy. See, that's why you have needs. That's why you have wants, and that's why you have desires, because you're saying, I have needs, I have wants, I have desires. But if you live on the street of wanting nothing, I don't want anything. Every need is met, every bill is paid, every desire is met. I live on the street of wanting nothing. I don't want anything. See, see I let that sink in. See, it's, it's kind of mind-blowing. People sitting there going, because you've never been in a situation where you didn't want anything. So it's hard for you to, to think about it. Well, I tell you what, as you meditate on it, you can get it. I would meditate on one and nothing, if nothing else. Once I found it, I start meditating on it. Because I always wanted something. Everybody sitting in this room right now wants something. Would you agree? But wait a minute, God says that you may be entire wanting what? So evidently, he wants you to want nothing. 
God wants you to what? But see, everybody in here wants something. I would rather think like God, act like God, and want nothing. And the only way I can want nothing is to first say it. Remember, the scripture says you'll have what you... So until you start saying you want nothing, you can't get to the point of wanting nothing. That's why I say you've got to move on the street. So every day, wake in the morning, I, I don't want anything. Every need is met, every bill is paid, every desire has been completed. Now, as you begin to say that, things will begin to happen in your life. But if you keep saying, oh, you know, I need this and I need that and, you know, I don't have enough of this. See, the only thing you're doing, you're speaking the results of your life. And so you're having what you say. You know, I need this. I don't have that. I want this. That's what you're having. Because that's what you're saying. I want you to move on wanting nothing street. There's plenty of room on my street. I want some neighbors. It would bless me to walk out of my house and see you. Oh, the saints of God? Yeah, you want to live across the street. Yeah, Brother Sneed lives across the street. Praise God, I see him living across the street. Brother Johnson is next door. Glory to God. Hey, Brother Johnson, we, boy, this is a great street, ain't it? When we have a block party, it would be a block party. You know why? Because everybody don't want nothing. See, it wouldn't be a block party where, watch this, watch this, watch this. See, y'all don't know about this kind of block party. So you have a block party where he fixed the barbecue. You have a block party where he fixed the chicken. You have a block party where he cooks the hot dogs. You have a bar block party where she makes the potato salad. No, on my street, don't nobody make nothing. We call somebody to bring the stuff in so we can enjoy the block party while somebody else is doing the cooking. We didn't pay somebody to do the cooking. All we do is sit down and enjoy and fellowship. That's on my street, on one nothing street. Who wants to live on that street? All y'all want to be my neighbors? Glory to God. <laughs> I'm going to get to doubt in a minute, I promise you. All right, verse um, 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him do what? Ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraid it not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask how? What's the next statement? But let him ask in what? Let him ask in what? What's the next statement? Why? For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Verse 7. Underline verse 7, because verse 7 is a pivotal scripture, and I don't want it to be a pivotal scripture in your life. But you, it's in the Bible, so it can apply to you. Let not that man think he shall receive what? Okay, what man is it talking about? It's talking about the man that asks in faith and wavers. He, asks, he calls himself asking in faith, but he wavers or he doubts. So a person that doubts, verse 7 is yours. Verse 7 says, let not that man think you shall receive what? Anything. I can't hear you. Anything. So you're not going to receive anything if you doubt. And that's why most people go around blaming God because they're always doubting. And then they want to blame God for what they don't have because they haven't done it right. Would you agree? Okay, now, I want to explain doubt in a way that maybe you haven't heard it, so turn to Mark chapter 11, and that's probably all the time I'll have to cover it today. We're going to start at Mark 11, and this is what we're going to do, because I want you to see in every single scripture 
why you doubt. Because you didn't do what the scripture says. And that's why people doubt. Because they don't do what the scripture says. Okay? Now, I gave you the definition for doubt last week. I'll give it to you one more time, real quickly. It means to be undecided, to be skeptical, to tend to disbelieve or distrust, to regard as unlikely, lack of conviction. Okay? Then I gave you the Greek definition of the word that we're looking at here in Scripture. It's the word diakrino, D-I-A-K-R-I-N-O. If you want to look it up, it's number uh, 1252 in Strong's Dictionary. And this is what it means. It means to separate or to divide. I'm not going to give you all of it, but it means to separate or to divide. Now I want you to write that down because separate and divide means the same, basically means the same thing. So this is what happens. When you doubt, to separate or divide means there's at least two things involved. Would you agree? So, if you have two things and you separate them or you have something and you divide it to where you have two things, it means you doubt it. Now, I'm going to show you in Scripture. It's really right in front of you. It amazes me nobody's ever seen it but me. Because doubt means separate or to divide something. So, let's, let's use the term separate for right now. So there's two things that you separate. Note. Note. You have to write note in your, I'm telling you, write something down. Anybody looking at me? When I say note, write note. <laughs> okay, note colon. To not doubt means I do not separate. To not doubt means I do not separate. I, see, I, can, I can see your faces right now and say, what is he talking about? That's okay, I'm going to show you. It's right in the scripture in front of you. You may think I'm crazy now, but now you're going to see how crazy you've been because you didn't see it. Okay? It's amazing how stuff is right in front of us and we don't see it. Okay? Have you got that? Note says what? Say it again. So to not doubt means I what? Okay. The second part of the note is, I'm going to give you something different. Okay, doubt, to not doubt means I must do two things. I must do two things. You got it? Okay, now, I'm going to show it to you in Scripture. Now watch this. In each doubt Scripture, there's at least two things written in the Scriptures that people don't do, and that's why they doubt. Because you have to do both of them. Are you listening to me? You have to do both of them. Right here in Mark 11, there are three sets of pairs. Three sets of pairs that you have to do all six of those things. Because if there's three sets of pairs, that means you've got to do them all. Would you agree? And if they don't do them all, you can see why people doubt. It's easy to see why folk doubt. Because they don't do everything God says to do. See, God doesn't tell you to do part of his word and ignore the rest of it. He wants you to do it all, right? Okay, let me start off with a simple one. This is a simple one. If you can't see this, I'm going to pay somebody to sit next to you and help you understand it. Okay, because I, I think you're smarter than that. I really think you can understand two things. If I give you two things, if I say A and B, you think you can figure out A and B? Okay, here we go. Mark, Mark chapter 11, verse 23. 
He says, for verily, I'm going to read the whole scripture, then I'll come back. For verily I say unto you, that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Would you agree? Okay, thing number one. Pair number one. Pair number one. Now, if you write it, if you take notes the way I do, you write pair number one, then you should write A and B because you want to see what the pair is. Because you got to make sure you do both of them. Remember, if you're not going to doubt, you got to do both of them. Would you agree? Okay. So I'll make it real easy for you. Pair number one, A. Pair number one, A. Whosoever shall say to this mountain, that's A. Whosoever shall say to the mountain, that's A. Here's B. Be thou removed, and be thou cast into the sea. So A is, you have to speak to the mountain, and B is, you have to tell it to leave and not come back. A is, speak to the mountain, and B is, tell it to leave and don't come back. Now I'm going to make it even simpler for you. Mountain is symbolic of a problem or challenge in your life. I want somebody to give me a challenge that they may be facing. Just willing to say, Pastor, I'm facing this. Just one. I come and see no hands. I'm trying to help you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Sickness, okay? Sickness or disease? Uh, you can name any sickness and disease you want to. So I'll just use one that's commonly known, okay? Let's say diabetes. That's a common one. Would you agree? So if you're facing that and it's in your body, you have to A, A, what? Okay, you got the revelation of speak to it. But I told you exactly what to say. What do you say? You tell it to what? Leave and B, tell it don't come back. That's what's saying to it, be thou removed, be thou cast into the sea. It simply means tell it to leave and tell it don't come back. So you say diabetes, leave, and diabetes, don't come back back. Would you agree? Huh? Now the reason diabetes, you speak to it and it comes back is because you tell it to leave but you don't tell it not to come back. You may pray about it but you don't tell it, to, you don't tell it never to come back. See, God says you have to do both. You have to tell it to leave and tell it not come back. Make it strong. Never come back. In Jesus' name. And you're speaking to the mountain. You're speaking to the mountain of disease in your body. Diabetes, leave and never come back. High, pressure, uh, high blood pressure, leave and never come back. Headaches, leave and never come back. Is that plain enough? Now, this is why they come back. You tell it to leave. But you don't tell it not to come back, so it may leave. And even the Bible says the devil left for a season. The reason he came back is because Jesus didn't tell him not to come back. Because Jesus operates in the same principles that we do. He knew he had to live throughout that thing. But wait a minute. He said here, tell the problem to leave. And tell it what? Don't come back. Is that difficult? Have you figured that out yet? So, see, what I want you to do right now, I want you to write three things down in your notes that you, that you personally are having challenges with. You don't have to tell nobody else but yourself. You know what they are. It can be money problems. can be whatever. It can be weight problems. Ooh, that's a big one. Amen. 
can be weight problems, can be family problems, mama problems, daddy problems, baby daddy problems, I don't care. Just write three things down that you have to tell to leave and tell not to come back. And now you're not going to do it right now, but what you're going to do when you get home in your prayer time, you're going to focus on these three things. Would you agree? Huh? Now, before I move on, I have to show you why you've been doubting. You've been doubting because maybe you told it to leave, but you didn't tell it not to come back. So when it came back, that causes you to doubt God's word. So you doubt because you told it to leave. You stood in the healing line, told it to leave, but you didn't tell it not to come back. Who's supposed to tell it not to come back? Huh? You are. You're supposed to tell it what? Not to come back. You receive your healing, diabetes, you bet not come back in this body. And you got to be kind of indignant and ugly about it. Because the devil needs to know that you mean what you say. Amen. Isn't that diabetes? I want you to leave. And I don't want, please don't come back. No. You, you wouldn't tell a dog that, would you? No. The dog was coming at, oh, dog, don't bother me. Don't bother me, dog. No. <laughs> no. For that dog to believe you, you got to stand up and look that dog in the eye, yeah. and you got to tell him something. Amen. Don't you? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. When are you going to get, the Bible talks about righteous indignation. When are you going to get mad enough to say something? When are you going to get mad enough for whatever the devil's trying to put on you to tell it to leave and tell it to don't? When are you going to get mad enough? Maybe you like it. Maybe you like being sick. Maybe you like being broke. Huh? Maybe you like being unmarried for 400 years. That's a big one, especially with ladies. They want a husband so bad, they can taste it. They go to sleep at night, and they have visions of sugar plums dancing in their heads. Huh? But me, I'd be saying, single life, you are gone. And you ain't coming back. In Jesus' name. Now God's got to provide somebody for you. Uh, look at your neighbor. Say, look at your neighbor. Tell him this. Say, don't go looking. It's amazing how, see, God provides and you go looking. I'm serious. Because, see, when you, <laughs> let, ooh, see, thank you. See, that was a revelation. I just got a revelation. Ooh, glory to God. You want to you see a real revelation? God just gave me a real revelation. I never said this before in life. This is going to help you. You're unmarried, aren't you? Yes, I know. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Remember, I just said, don't go looking. Huh? Didn't I say don't go looking? Does God need your help? Okay, watch this. This is what happens when you look. The Bible says, everybody say the Bible says. The Bible says. Seek, Seek, and ye shall find. So you go looking, you're going to find somebody. But it ain't what God wants. Do you hear what I just said? That's why you don't need to go looking. That applies to men and women. Men go looking, and they find something. The only thing what you find may not be what God wants you to have. That's why shut, close your eyes. Walking the, you know, how, the races, how they race them horses, and they have them things called blinders on them. You ought to walk in church with blinders on. Instead of walking in church with blinders on, you walk in church with a swivel neck. And you got help. You got your girlfriend. You ought to walk in church with blinders. Don't see nothing. Don't see nobody but God. I'm walking through the church doors. I'm looking for God and the things of God. I ain't looking for no man. I ain't looking for no wife. I'm looking for God. It says he'll keep you in perfect peace whose eyes is stayed on who? Him. Not on way out Willie. 
I don't care where our will is an usher. A lot of women come in looking for an usher. I'm just being honest. You know what I'm talking about. And I've heard, I've heard worldly men say they come to the church to find a wife. So they come to the church looking for a woman. Ladies, that's not the kind of man you want. You want a godly man. You want a man that loves God. You want a man that is already serving God, not coming to church to find you. Amen. Because you see, if you go to church looking for a man, the man that God has for you may not be at this church. He may be, he may be in a church in New York. He may be in a church in Mississippi. He may be in a church in Chicago. He may be in a church in Los Angeles. But I guarantee you, God knows where he is. And in case you didn't know, God can find a way from him for him to get from New York to St. Louis. Even if he had to change jobs, the man happens to work for a company. After he works for, I'll just use this, I'm not using it in a bad way, I'm using it in a good way, but let's say he works for UPS, or he works for FedEx, and he gets a transfer from Los Angeles to St. Louis. This is your man. And the reason that happens it's because God knew that you were here and you weren't going anywhere, so he transported him from there to here, just for you. You don't need to go to church and look for him. God can bring him right to your front door. <laughs> Knock on your door. So I got a package for you. He said, I didn't order nothing. Oh, yes, you did. You ordered me. You just didn't know it. <laughs> you ordered me from the throne room and God transported me right to your front porch. Would that get your attention? Huh? See, God wants to do special things like that in your life. That's what he wants. And I guarantee you, you'll sign for that one. <laughs> 